I've got a mobile phone holder up here if anyone wants me to look after their phone for the next 20 minutes. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, there's a word evolution and it's a fascinating word because it explains if you're a scientist and if you're connected to the landscape, uh, everything that we see in terms of other living things. And uh, it would be amazing if the human society, I suppose, could adopt something to do with, with evolution in the way we think and the way we engage with the landscape. Um, because so much of our problems, our conservation issues, um, result in this very structured, unwilling to evolve mindset which has been applied to this landscape. Um, but we're in a fantastic time at the moment and you can feel it in the air in terms of um, positive change. I'd really like to thank um, the, the Welcome to Country, um, Nick, and this this feeling about Indigenous culture because um, we sort of started with Noongar occupation here and we're kind of gradually coming around the circle to hopefully eventually meet up um, in a knowledge state where we started uh, when colonisation happened which is about um, connection to country and valuing our wildlife for more than just hobbies. So I'm, I'm really positive about where we're heading. Um, so I want to yeah, pay my respects to, um, to Maru and to Noongar elders past and present um, and um, Wailich is the wedge-tailed eagle if you're in Noongar country. Wailawuru is the wedge-tailed eagle um, if you're out on, on Madu country. Um, and oh, just back to the evolution thing as well, there was a term volunteer burnout. That was something completely different when I was at university. So um, that's a, an example of a term being able to evolve to, to modern times, which is awesome. Um, so I want to start by thanking people. Acknowledgements often come at the end, but I'm only here today because of you people that have come to... Um, this symposium, um, Tegan and Vicky and Beck, all the people that uh, this beautiful community and family that is um, Australian conservation. I don't know why the, the slide's half cut off, but it um, doesn't matter. You'll, you'll only get three quarters of the talk. Um, I want to also thank the GMG who sponsored my research out at, at um, Marawa, and that's been happening for a few years, um, despite the fact that they gave me this brand new jumper that went to Scotland with me, um, where I was learning about eagle research on golden eagles. Um, oh, you don't see the bird poo on me. That's annoying. <laughs> anyway, the piece that's cut off is a huge piece of golden eagle poo. He weighed three kilos when I picked him up and only two when I put him down. Um, but that's just to, to say thanks to the GMG. Um, there's a, um, it's a bit of a pain that doesn't fit on the screen, isn't it? Um, I don't really know what to do. Um, I might, I'm conscious of time, but I might just, sorry, do a very quick um, displays. Arrangement. New displays. Let's just see if it's going to reset. Why don't you reset? Okay. Scaled. Okay. Come on. You can do it. Oh. That was dangerous. <laughs> Alright, that, that looks better. You could do it. No, I don't want Dell like Mac, please. <laughs> that looks better. Stories, everything. And I reckon, um, again, we have so much to learn from Indigenous cultures because the main way that knowledge was passed off on across generations was through storytelling. Unfortunately, in our society today, the word story, the popular definition of it, implies a false or a fact. A, 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 a fiction story basically but story is just a vehicle to portray knowledge and I reckon um, we need to be educating our kids to become storytellers before they become scientists because that's the most important thing and story there's so many ways you can spin stories positive or negative but we only re-engage people with the landscape through positive storytelling now if you're an Australian uh, who's a tourist in New Zealand this is a terrifying negative story of a roadblock but if you're in New Zealand there's hundreds of opportunities right there in front of you. Um, I'm going to leave your interpretation of the rest of it to, to, to whatever you want. Um, Noel Nanup said one thing to me, Noel Nanup's a Noongar elder, and he said a thing to me that I've never forgotten, and it's that uh, when in Noongar culture you are given a totem species, you, uh, your purpose on this planet is to learn as much about that totem species as you can until you start seeing the, eyes, seeing the landscape through the eyes of that totem species. Um, I'm not that tall, I'm only two metres above the ground, but I think we have, I, I have eagles in my, my court, we're in my inner spirit, and they offer a perspective on life and the landscape, um, which I'm constantly thinking back to the sky. So both spatially, if we go up in the air and get a bird's eye perspective from a wedge-tailed eagle's 
uh, place in the sky. Um, it's really valuable. Um, and as scientists, we're cost constantly having to change our temporal perspective by going back in through the literature, back into history, to use information to inform where we are now. So that's just something to think about as well. And on that, um, I feel like it's important to tell the wedge-tailed eagle story through the perspective of, of land use. So 200 years ago or more, South West WA was a vast, amazing economy. Um, just, it was full of, of different jobs, heaps of different roles in the landscape, um, and incredibly bustling and diverse. And in a very short range of time, there was a mass uh, load of redundancies that happened. Heaps of jobs were, were disappeared um, because of a change in mindset. And a few of those jobs boomed and benefited really, really well from the change in landscape, but most of them didn't. So these are the animals, mammals, if you're an eagle that eats mammals, um, they, ones that are found in the Mundaring, were found in the Mundaring Shire where I live, some jobs were introduced that no one had ever heard of before and they started booming and, and doing really well in a modified landscape as well and certainly so were others. From an eagle's perspective your diet became very very simplified and this led to one of the most well, uh, well known persecution cases. So wedge-tailed eagles were one of the per most persecuted raptors in the world. Hundreds of thousands of bounties were paid by all state governments for a hundred years. And lots of kids don't know this story, so it's very important that they are aware of an attitude to a native component of an ecosystem, which um, was just, we need to wipe this thing out. Um, unfortunately, old habits die hard, and some people still cling on to these attitude changes. So this was a case you've probably heard of um, that came out just a couple of months ago from Victoria. Um, about 400 birds in a, in a mass grave over a couple of years um, of wedge charity was being poisoned. Um, which, is, which is terrible, but hopefully we're gradually going to educate our, our younger people. In order to address the, the issue of paying bounties on a native species and was it worth spending the money on, on, on killing them essentially, the CSIRO in 1967 launched this amazing research project which for me has become a, a huge source of inspiration. Michael Ridpath was leading the research and that involved um, looking at their diet and finding that they don't pose a threat to the sheep industry, which they kind of knew anyway. Um, and the key thing that stood out for me from one of the four publications that came out of this 10-year study uh, was that <coughs> eagle populations could suffer serious consequences if major habitat changes uh, occur and the, the, the consequences wouldn't be immediately obvious for a long-lived bird. So vigilance and monitoring are necessary. And monitoring just stood out to me. That's just environmental engagement, ongoing uh, checking the, the barometer of our ecosystems that we need. And that hasn't happened for this species since the research really finished. That research was the first time in, Australia, in Western Australia where wedge-tailed eagle movements were studied. And that was done through banding a range of birds, including nestlings, and there were not many recovered. So only about 25 birds were recovered in about 400 that were banded. And this was the first insight into these amazing long distance movements that the birds made. But all these recoveries were dead birds. Um, so that doesn't really tell you that much other than that it was born there or trapped there and it was poisoned on a sheep station um, there. In 1967, that was another pivotal year. This uh, young pom met this other really young, much younger pom and they got married and came out on the fair sky to Perth. Um, so that's my mum and dad. Um, they had a family and everything was going really well and then 15 years later they had this other crazy little, um, was born almost a metre long, not really. Um, I was always going to be tall. Um, I was a breech birth and my dad said that's because my bum was going to be more useful than my head. Um, I grew up loving birds. I'll skip through this bit but um, was very fortunate to grow up in the hills, engage with the landscape. Birds were my, my passion and still are. So are tree climbing. The joke is I'm really tall and I don't need to climb trees to get to eagle nests, but um, that's not true. They nest a bit higher than that. Uh, I used climbing equipment since I was young to abseil and, and learn about all the rope techniques and used to go to the national park, climb up trees, um, build tree houses. And this is when Wirelich cast its spell on me when I was 15 years old and I found a nest and thought, uh, these are my totem animals. I didn't really know. But that taught me something about collecting. Um, what do you collect? Well, if you collect um, cartagen, which is knowledge or knowing, um, you can never have a complete collection every single day of your life. You have the opportunity to fly out around your home range, take a stick of knowledge and bring it back to your nest, which is your kata, your head, 
and expand your view of the world. And I try and encourage kids to think about that in my workshops these days um, as, a, as a way of thinking about birds' nests. And birds' nests are so representative of their environment. You can find bits of string in honey eaters' nests and that tells a story of where that came from. So um, there's a lot to think about. I did a master's in New Zealand and learnt m massively that from that that science is happening so much and people are really keen to get involved in careers but the key thing that's missing is communication which comes back to that storytelling. And we as scientists are trained from university to turn stories into published papers. Um, those themselves are stories but immediately that partitions off some of the cartagen into accessibility to a very narrow section of the community and that's why these kind of things where we're bringing knowledge together from different walks of life is so important but what's critical and what's happening and that's why I'm positive about things is this citizen science stuff, this community engagement stuff because it's so important that communities are, are engaged and the general public is aware of what most people can't necessarily understand from a statistically based jargonistic published piece of paper and I've been criticised as a, as a scientist um, for putting huge amounts of effort into community engagement before publication but that's because I can see the value when you engage communities and you spread love into the landscape and, and through charismatic species like cockatoos that's what we need to be harnessing first and we can, we can publish stuff all the time but unless people understand the significance of it and how it affects them we're not going to conserve um, what we want to. So here's another analogy, this isn't a really, really tall guy. Um, this is the lowest wedge tail eagle nest ever recorded on the Nullarbor, 30 centimetres above the ground. Um, so it was pretty easily accessible there, but nowadays um, you need specialist skills and, and um, you need to still be tall and, and skinny to get up there. So I'm going to skip basically through and just um, emphasise the point that connection to Indigenous cultures and, and this voice that we're gradually seeing rising up out of the the depth is, is spreading and these beautiful Māori elders that endorse and, and support what we do out on, on Marua um, are helping spread this attitude hopefully that you know e ecology is about us in the landscape not dominating over it. Um, it's important because our ecosystems keep us alive and we need to put heart and mind back into it. Does that, how long does that mean I've got five minutes? Uh, two. two minutes, crikey I knew it was going to go over. Um, so, to the satellite tracking, what I've been doing um, for a PhD is um, putting transmitters on juvenile wedge-tailed eagles. My question is how does the population of the wedge-tailed eagle, a key apex predator, integrate with the current landscape? And that's got a few different levels, um, nesting density in two different areas, productivity in two different areas, adult home range and, and habitat use, and then juvenile dispersal, where do the young birds go? The dispersal is what I've spent most energy uh, answering the questions at the moment um, and just before I get to the transmitters I want to talk about um, what we do at Marawa. So I, we now have, we fly a helicopter the day before we start field work um, and over this beautiful Mulga woodland of Marawa uh, and we check over a hundred eagle nests that are out there. This is a really exciting find if we get a chick in a nest in October but most nests um, are not active and Maru um, community comes out um, onto Maru for a few days and I'm really keen to spend a long time with, with some of these teenage kids this year. Um, the first thing I do is put the eagle's perspective in everyone's mind and draw a map in the sand of the, the country that we're working on and draw lots of circles which represent um, the eagle's uh, home ranges. So this is the, the Marua boundary, it's about two and a half thousand square kilometres. This is a fenced enclosure that Parks and Wildlife established uh, to reintroduce threatened species of mammals. Uh, these are the hundred or so eagle nests we've recorded, um, but this is more accurately or, or a better way to look at the, the landscape. Um, lots of pairs, each of which has a nest that's usually active, but most pairs don't breed successfully each year. So some have chicks, but others are just hanging around the nest and they're only breeding if it's a good year. So we paint all these pictures in the sand um, and try and emphasise that, you know, Māori people are the best trackers the best scientists, the best environmental detectives on the planet. Um, lots of, and to try and reinstill that into the kids. So many people say, oh, eagles, you don't see many. I don't see many eagles. Um, but unfortunately, what most people see doesn't replicate or represent what is so. They're, they're ghosts in the landscape. Um, and so you need to start thinking, okay, there's a big piece of white street there. I don't think anyone's been up there painting. Um, I think that's probably a raptor. And start looking at the way that the eagles can kind of be in the landscape without being easily detectable. So we find nests, we visit nests, um, 
and we're, we're running an ongoing banding project which involves banding and colour banding and, and getting the kids, um, hopefully these kids will be ban running the banding projects when I'm dead and gone in however many years time. And each eagle is named, um, whether it's banded or satellite tagged. And the colour banding is the way I see it as an ongoing engagement for the community um, into the future. Like Nick's fairy turn stuff, we're using eagles colours, blue and yellow. Um, so blue is Marawa and we use um, yellow here in Perth. Please take a photo of that or ask me afterwards and you can um, to help report the, the sightings. So birds with satellite transmitters where you fit, uh, fit these tiny little tags um, which are 70 grams. Um, when the, the birds have been tagged I take the pictures of the birds into the classroom and the kids uh, name come up with names for the birds and they're all in Māori language um, or Noongar language here and people say oh it's a bit difficult to understand and how do you how do you pronounce that word but everything is difficult when you've never experienced it much before and um, this is built into what a lot of these kids do at school um, so we tagged seven um, Wallawurus, seven wedge-tailed eagles last year at Marawa, sorry, six. Um, so we, we had a brood of twins um, and some individual male chicks here and some individual female chicks, so from, from different nests. Um, and the movements have been amazing, and not just the fact that they go hundreds of kilometres, they go thousands of kilometres, but over very, very short spaces of time. So this is a bird from Perth that went up to close to Darwin, past Lake Argyll in, just in four weeks. Um, these are some of the journeys of other birds from Perth and the birds from Marawa. Um, if it's going to work, it's stopping. It's probably telling me that I should stop anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, we've had a freeze. Um, but you can talk to me about it more for, for questions after if you want. Um, does anyone have any questions to start? To, now, uh, now the computer's told me we were finishing. Yes? <laughs> Um, they last for, for years, provided they have uh, solar charge. So they, the longest transmitter that's worked on a bald eagle in America was for nine years. Um, but the, the harness deployment, we're using temporary harnesses with, with cotton stitching. Um, I'm looking at, um, so that some of them fall off after a, a few years. Um, but I'm trying to capture at least the first 12 months um, after the birds have, flat, have left their, their natal home range. Um, in, and see what their early movements are. Yes? Um, do you know what the population of birds are in West Australia? Um, no. So there are, there are the, the only way that we can sort of look at populations is through things like the Bird Atlas and Census. But what Census um, does is it applies similar methodology across all bird groups. But with raptors, um, you have different age classes in the landscape. So you can see a juvenile or you can see a sub or an adult and it means different things. Um, what the tracking data has shown is that immediately it would be easy to overestimate how many birds are out there because you can drive across the Nullarbor and see a juvenile that you then may re-encounter in the Pilbara two days later. Um, so in terms of population it's only estimates but um, probably in, in Western Australia um, probably hundreds or maybe even more than thousands of breeding pairs, more than a thousand breeding pairs but we monitor um, about 90 breeding pairs between the two the two sites. Thanks. Okay, we might leave it there because it's morning tea time and if you have any more I don't want to stand in can, front of anyone in the morning tea. We can um, yeah, ask them Christ. later in the day.